Good evening and welcome and thank you all for joining us for this webinar, um, which is the first of a series of four presentations that we'll be giving on the subject of co-occurring mental health and substance use disorders. And these are funded by the Central and Eastern Sydney Primary Health Network. My name is Catherine Mills. I'm an Associate Professor and Director of Treatment Research at the Centre of Research Excellence in Mental Health and Substance Use at the University of New South Wales. And I have the pleasure of facilitating this webinar, which will be presented by Dr. Christina Morell. Firstly, though, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Vidrigal and Gadrigal people that are the traditional custodians of this land. And I'd also like to pay my respects to elders both past and present and extend the respect to other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who are with us today. Um, as I mentioned, we have an exciting series of four webinars that will be undertaken over the remainder of the year. And this is the first webinar, which will provide a basic introduction to comorbidity and overview of the identification, management and treatment of co-occurring disorders. So the three remaining seminars will cover these topics in more detail. So the next mm -hmm. webinar on the 7th of November will address identification. The one after that on the 21st of November will look at management and treatment. And then the last to be held on the 5th of December will focus on the physical health of people with co-occurring mental and substance use disorder. And you can register for any of these events via the CESPEN website when using the links on this slide. And if you happen to miss any of these webinars, uh, the video and handouts will be available from the CREMS website, uh, which is comorbidity.edu.au slash training slash webinars. And I'll put those details up um, for you later. And on this site, you'll also find some links to other webinars for health professionals, but also for the community, teachers and parents on topics that relate to substance use and mental health and their prevention and treatment. So just before we begin, I um, just wanted to draw your attention to the Q&A um, icon that's at the bottom or somewhere on your screen. Um, please feel free to click on that at any time and type in any questions or any comments that you might have. We will have 10 to 15 minutes at the end of Christina's talk to uh, run through these and have discussion. Secondly, if you have any technical issues during the webinar, um, you can call the technical support line with the details that are on the screen there, or visit the Zoom support webpage, which there is also a link on the screen there and chat to the online staff. But I'll also put this information under chat uh, when we start so that you can find it at any time during the presentation if you need to. Um, and yet, as I mentioned just lastly, we will be recording this. So if you'd like to view it again or download the slides or handouts, uh, access them at another time, you can do that at the website on your screen. So it is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Christina Morell, who is a research fellow at the Centre of Research Excellence in Mental Health and Substance Use at the University of New South Wales. And her research aims to improve our understanding and responses to co-occurring mental and substance use disorders, in particular in complex populations that often have multiple chronic conditions that require um, multiple different services uh, to, to respond. Christine's work is built on a very strong foundation of collaboration with clinicians, other researchers, consumers, carers, and other key stakeholders. And a big part of her work really focuses on translating research findings into evidence-based resources for clinicians and the community. Thanks, Christine. Thanks, Kath. And thanks so much for joining us for this webinar today. Um, so as Kath said, the focus of the webinar is on uh, co-occurring substance use and mental disorders and the implications for managing and delivering best practice healthcare. So a lot of the material that I'll be talking about today will be drawing directly on the second edition of the National Comorbidity Guidelines, which are more formally known as guidelines on the management of alcohol and other drug and mental um, health conditions in alcohol and other drug treatment settings. Very long title, very long book. Um, the guidelines were launched late last year and these were developed as part of a broader program of work which is being conducted um, through the CREMS program at the National Drug and Alcohol Research Centre. So I won't be going too much in detail, but if you're interested in this resource, it can be accessed at this link here and downloaded in PDF. 
So I also wanted to give a quick overview of the learning outcomes of tonight's webinar before we get started. And these are to have an understanding of what comorbidity is, why it occurs and why it's concerning, have improved awareness of how to access a range of evidence-based options for identifying, managing and treating mental health symptoms within a holistic healthcare approach, and have a better understanding of a coordinated approach to managing comorbidity and how to involve multiple services to deliver coordinated care. So in terms of what we'll be talking about in the webinar, I'm going to give an overview of what we know about comorbidity, including the prevalence and some background about mental health and substance use. We'll then talk a bit about specific population groups, barriers to care, the harms associated with comorbidity, as well as causality. I'll then give a bit of an overview of how we go about identifying comorbidity and then what to do once it has been identified with a particular emphasis on holistic healthcare. So focusing not just on the client or the patient's mental health and substance use, but also their physical health and other factors that might contribute to their overall well-being. And I'll then talk a bit about some management and treatment strategies, and then a bit about the importance of coordinated care. So while I will be giving an overview of each of these in the talk tonight, um, more detail about most of these topics will be covered in greater detail in future webinars, as Kath said just a minute ago. So first of all, starting with background, what do we know about comorbidity? And before doing that, I really just want to clarify what we mean by the term comorbidity. So broadly defined, comorbidity refers to the co-occurrence, either lifetime or current, of two or more disorders. And our focus here is on the co-occurrence of alcohol or other drug, or AOD, and mental health disorders or conditions. There are, of course, lots of other types of comorbidity, including other AOD use disorders, including tobacco, physical health conditions, such as cirrhosis, hepatitis, heart disease and diabetes, intellectual and learning disabilities, cognitive impairment, and chronic pain. And the co-occurrence of one or more AOD use disorders with one or more mental health conditions is often referred to as dual diagnosis, but this term is often misleading as many clients present with a range of co-occurring disorders um, or conditions of varying severity. In terms of what we know about comorbidity, we know that it's common. Mental health and substance use disorders are two of Australia's most common and burdensome health conditions, and they affect around one in five Australian adults each year. They frequently co-occur. So it's estimated that about one in three Australians with a substance use disorder also has a mental health disorder, but this rate can be as high as 75% among people who are seeking treatment. Comorbidity has always been a feature among patients with AOD conditions. Those of you who are clinicians will likely have seen all manner of comorbidity among your patients with AOD use disorders. But in terms of why it's received increasing attention, comorbidity was first able to be measured at a population level in North America in the 1980s and, report, and reported in the literature as the Epidemiologic Catchment Area Surveys um, study sorry, in the 1990s. So several structured diagnostic interviews were developed, which greatly facilitated large-scale, nationally representative population surveys. In our own nationally representative surveys, the National Survey of Mental Health and Wellbeing, um, conducted in 1997 and 2007 by the Australian Bureau of Statistics, um, and both of these surveys identified large rates of comorbidity between and within classes of disorders. So the 2007 National Survey of Mental Health and Wellbeing um, sampled almost 9,000 Australian adults between the ages of 16 and 85 years. And the figure on the screen here shows the prevalence rates of disorders in the general, um, sorry, the general adult population in 2007. So almost half, or about 45%, of people had any mental disorder at some point in their lifetime. 20% had an active disorder in the last 12 months. And this figure also shows how 12 month prevalence rates were identified. So that is as a proportion of those with a lifetime disorder who had an active disorder in the past 12 months. Approximately 35% of people with a substance use disorder have at least one co-occurring affective or anxiety disorder. And this represents about 300,000 Australian adults. There also tends to be higher rates of substance use and mental health conditions among some populations in comparison to the general population. So for instance, among homeless people, researchers highlighted the complex AOD use histories and extensive poly drug use um, in homeless populations with one study finding that 42% of participants reported severe levels of depression and 57% screened positive for current post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD. 
more than one third had received a lifetime diagnosis of schizophrenia or another psychotic disorder. Rates of AOD use and mental health disorders are also elevated among prison populations. The most recent mental health um, of prison entrants in Australia report, which is conducted by the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare, found that a third of prison entrants reported having received a formal mental health or substance use diagnosis, which is two and a half times higher, two and a half times higher than the general population. So 16% were taking medication for their mental health disorder and 14% were experiencing very high levels of psychological distress. In, in comparison with other prison entrants, those with poor mental health had more extensive prison histories, poorer education, higher rates of unemployment and substance use. There were also higher rates of risky alcohol, illicit drug use and smoking than in the general population, particularly among those with high levels of psychological distress. And of course, these are just some of the different population groups who experience high rates of substance use and mental health conditions. There are many others. In terms of the most common mental health conditions that we see to co-occur with substance use disorders, these are typically the same as those that we see in the general population, um, which are anxiety and depression, post-traumatic stress disorder and personality disorders. And we also see elevated rates of bipolar disorder, psychosis, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder and eating disorders. And then the fact that these disorders co-occur is problematic because once they're established, each serves to maintain and exacerbate the other. There are also many people who experience symptoms of disorders, but don't necessarily meet the, the criteria for a diagnosis of a disorder. This means that many people can still have their lives significantly disrupted by symptoms of their mental health disorders, but without meeting the diagnostic criteria, they tend to fly under the radar of some services. So rather than thinking of mental health as nearly the presence or the absence of a disorder, it can be quite useful to think of mental health conditions existing on a continuum ranging from mild symptoms such as mild depression to severe disorders such as schizophrenia or psychotic suicidal depression on the other end. Um, so with the development of newer versions of classification systems such as the DSM-5 and the ICD-11, there's been a move towards more dimensional rather than categorical view of disorders. The prevalence of mental health disorders may vary between substances, but there's been little research conducted which compares the rates of mental health disorders across different types of AOD use disorders. So there's not a lot of information available that can help guide health practitioners in this sense. Um, substance use among people with mental health dis disorders tends to mirror the general population trends in terms of availability and fashion. In the general population, the most commonly used substances are uh, alcohol and tobacco, with a much smaller proportion in, of the population using illicit substances. And of the illicit substances, the most commonly used are general, uh, cannabis, followed by um, a smaller proportion who use methamphetamines, ecstasy, cocaine, hallucinogens, inhalants, heroin, synthetic canna cannabinoids, ketamine, new and emerging psychoactive substances, and GHB. And again, small proportions use non-prescription pharmaceuticals, including analgesics, tranquilizers, steroids, methadone or buprenorphine, and other opiates. But when do we need to become concerned about a person's use? Do we need to respond to any use, or is it really only when a person is dependent on substances that we need to be thinking about intervention? Not everybody who uses will become dependent. The evidence indicates that um, the most addictive substance is tobacco, with up to an estimated two thirds of people going on to, depend, um, to develop dependence after using it. And this is then followed by cocaine, heroin, alcohol and cannabis, with up to a fifth of users developing dependence. But it's really important to note that while many people drink or use at high levels without meeting the criteria for a disorder, they may nonetheless be risk of harm, at risk of harm. So I won't um, go into detail about the characteristics of people who are at risk of becoming dependent, but I would like to launch a poll here and ask you all who you think that of the people pictured in this slide um, is more likely to um, develop or have a substance use disorder. So I'll just give you a minute to have a look at that. And do you think it is likely to be, or more likely to be person one, person two, person three, person four, person five or person six. I'll just wait a minute or a little bit longer.
Okay. So looks like just sorry a few more people are answering. Okay, like five more seconds. This is the last responses to come in. Okay, for those of you who said, I think only two people have got it right. <laughs> um, I'll just show you what everybody has said in case you're interested. So for those of you who said um, person number five, statistically speaking, you're right. The um, young man in the suit is more likely to have a substance use disorder. So it's really important to remember that anybody can develop a substance uh, or can develop a disorder, having said that, and also really want to make a brief mention that there's often a lack of recognition of substance use and mental health disorders because of assumptions about um, what a person with these disorders might look like. So in general, few people who experience these conditions access treatment, in part because they have difficulty accessing services and because of the stigma that they're faced with when they do. So an estimated one in 10 people with a substance use disorder alone seek treatment, but when you have substance use, mood and anxiety, this rate increases to around 70 to 80%, which indicates that mental health or the complexities that accompany comorbidity might act as a driver into treatment. And even among those um, people who do manage to access treatment, there's often a delay between the time that they start to develop symptoms and when they manage to make treatment contact. So I'm going to ask another poll um, and ask you all out there. Sorry, just going to figure out how to get the second poll to work. Okay, so I ask you, um, have a guess at what the average length in which it takes the one in three Australians with an alcohol use disorder to seek treatment. So do you think it's six months, 12 months, three years, five years, 10 years, 15 years, 18 years or 20 years? Um, so there's a lot of different options there. Um, have your best guess. There's some results are coming in quite a big difference between six months and 20 years, I know. Don't be shy. I'll just give it another um, 10 seconds. And I, I won't share these ones, I'll keep them private. Okay, so five more seconds. Okay, so actually nobody got this one right, which is really interesting. Um, so for the, for, um, it's actually 18 years, which is, I mean, really crazy when you think about it, but the evidence tells us that the median delay among people with alcohol use disorders who eventually make treatment contact in Australia is 18 years. Um, yeah, which is ridiculous. So a large part of the problem um, in people being able to access treatment is that our clinical services, and particularly those for people with comorbidity, um, have traditionally adopted a siloed approach in which mental and substance use disorders are treated, treated separately. And as a consequence, people can be bounced between mental health and AOD services with little continuity or coordination of care, and many end up falling between the cracks in the healthcare system. People with comorbidity often have difficulty navigating their way through available services, which can be really difficult to access even when you're well, um, with multiple entry points and multiple options of treatment pathways, agencies and healthcare providers. So often by the time somebody with these disorders is ready to access treatment, they've been experiencing symptoms for many years and it can be really difficult to be bounced and referred between services like a treatment roundabout or be faced with a closed door. So in terms of why we're concerned about comorbidity and people with comorbidity, it's a problem because not only do people with comorbidity experience symptoms of their mental health and substance use disorders, they also have complex presentations and these can complicate treatment and recovery. And research has shown that people with mental or substance use disorders die an astonishing 20 to 30 years earlier than the general population and spend the last 10 years of life living with disabling chronic illnesses. 
In fact, comorbidity has been identified by the Mental Health Commission as one of, as one of health's most significant challenges. This is partly because they're chronic diseases of the young, with 75% of mental and substance use disorders emerging before the age of 25. So the burden associated with these conditions is, con is concentrated among young people um, when they're really supposed to be at their most productive. The median age of onset um, differs between disorders and it's really earliest for anxiety disorders with a median age of onset estimated to be 15 years old, followed by alcohol use at 16. Um, alcohol use disorders typically have their onset around the age of 20, and this is followed by affective disorders, which has its onset around the age of 24. So if we move on to thinking about how comorbidity occurs, there are several possible ways that comorbidity can develop. So in some cases, the AOD use disorder comes about because of a um, repeated AOD use to relieve or cope with mental health symptoms. This is often described as a self-medication hypothesis and that substances are used in an attempt to relieve or medicate mental health symptoms. In these circumstances, mental health conditions may become more apparent after the AOD use has ceased. Alternatively, AOD intoxication and withdrawal can induce a variety of mental health symptoms and disorders such as depression, bipolar, anxiety, obsessive compulsive and psychotic disorders. In the majority of cases, these effects subside and eventually disappear with abstinence. But for some people, symptoms might continue even after they've stopped drinking or using substances. So if one condition has an effect on an intermediary factor, which then increases the likelihood of developing a second condition, an indirect causal relationship exists. So for example, research has shown that early onset AOD use reduces the likelihood of finishing high school, entering tertiary education, and then completing tertiary education. Poor education can or might lead to difficulties in later life, such as unemployment, which can then lead to other problems such as depression. And then the reverse is also possible, where a depressive disorder can make it more difficult to complete work and study commitments, which then in turn can lead to difficulties finding employment, increasing the risk of AOD use. The co-occurrence of AOD and mental health conditions can also come about um, due to shared biological, psychological, social or environmental risk factors. So in other words, the factors that increase the risk of a person developing one, um, one condition can also increase the risk of another. So for example, both AOD and mental health conditions have been associated with lower socioeconomic status, cognitive impairment, the presence of conduct disorder in childhood and antisocial personality disorder or ASPD. It's also possible that genetics plays a role. So although establishing the order of onset between conditions can be really useful for understanding the relationship between them, once comorbidity has been established, it's most likely that the relationship between um, conditions is one of mutual influence rather than there being a clear causal pathway. So as I said, potentially um, complicating treatment and recovery. And irrespective of what order the conditions developed, the strategies used to manage and treat, uh, well, sorry, the strategies used to manage them are the same. So the key points um, of what we've covered so far are comorbidity is common. This can complicate treat a person's treatment and recovery. Once comorbidity has been established, it's most likely the relationship between disorders is one of mutual influence. And irrespective of what order comorbidity is, can't, has developed or the comorbid conditions has developed, the strategies used to manage these conditions is the same. And a number of barriers make it difficult for people with comorbidity to receive effective treatment. So I'll move on to the next topic of our webinar, which is how can we identify comorbidity? So in talking through the next few sections, I'd just like to introduce you to Layla. Layla is a 30 year old um, female who was feeling pretty good, but had some trouble sleeping. So she went to her GP to get her mum off her back. She was employed as a full-time bank teller. She grew up in a really happy family and um, she thinks of herself as the life of the party. Her mum was quite concerned and wanting her to see somebody following her recent, Layla's recent arrest in the middle of the city. So she'd consumed um, quite a lot of alcohol and started to strip in a supermarket. She's also been increasingly distracted and irritable at work and spending excessively on her credit card. So along with huge credit card bills, she's lost a lot of weight. Her friends have told her they don't like being around her anymore. But Layla has felt amazing and doesn't see that anything is wrong. Although Layla has been working intermittently, it's only because her boss is a family friend that she's been able to hang on to her job. 
And of course, this is just one way in which a person with comorbidity might present to services. There are many different presentations. But if somebody with Layla's presentation attends a service, what are the next steps? So how is her comorbidity identified? In general, the identification can be really tricky because despite high rates of mental health conditions, the detection and treatment of these coexisting problems is quite low. That's why it's very important to screen um, all clients systematically as part of routine clinical care, as part of case formulation process. Awareness of co-occurring problems will assist with the management of more complex presentations and treatment process, and sorry, treatment planning. But of course, to um, identify problems accurately, there might be a need to involve professionals that are trained and experienced in differential diagnosis. The screening can help identify the potential need for more formal psychiatric assessment. A multiple assessments conducted throughout treatment can take into account changes in symptoms over time and then be fed back into the treatment process. Three elements that can be helpful in identifying comorbidity and that these are, I'll go through today, including, include screening, assessment and case formulation. Screening is the process of identifying possible cases of co-occurring mental health conditions. It's not diagnostic, it can't establish whether the diagnosis exists, but it can be really useful in identifying symptoms which are typical of a disorder and highlighting the need for further assessment. Ideally, screening should occur after a two to four week stabilization period, but in practice, um, this can be very difficult within treatment settings for somebody to achieve this. So um, workers really need to be aware of the potential for false positives, which can occur if clients or patients are screened during periods of acute intoxication or withdrawal. And to avoid the possibility of misdiagnosis or false positives, multiple assessments should be conducted over time. Some mental health instruments that workers might find useful include the Camberwell Assessment of Need, Short Appraisal Schedule or the Kansas, the Kessler Psychological Distress Scale or the K10, and the Depression Anxiety Stress Scale or the DAS. Some alcohol and other drug use instruments that might be useful um, include the CAGE questionnaire, which assesses problem drinking, the Michigan Alcohol Screening Test, or the MAST, which assesses lifetime problems with alcohol use, the Drug Abuse Screening Test, the Alcohol Use Disorders Identification Test, and the Drug Use Disorders Identification Test. All of these tools are free to use, and you can access the Kansas P, the K10, and the DAS21, as well as their scores in the comorbidity guidelines that I mentioned before. And I've put a link um, to the PDF on these slides and you'll be able to actually click on the link and action those uh, at the end if you um, download these slides as a handout. I'll give you the link to do that later as well. But of course, um, these screeners and these instruments are just a few examples of screening instruments. There are many, many more, some with and without costs and some that require clinician training or other accreditations before you can use them. We will be talking more about screening and assessment in the next webinar but additional screening tools are also located in the body and the appendix of the comorbidity guidelines, and these cover a broader range of conditions. Another resource that might be useful is Mark Deedy's 2009 review of screening and assessment tools for use in AOD settings. And this includes a comprehensive overview of all screening and assessment measures, where these can be accessed, whether there's a cost involved in their use, details of their reliability and validity in AOD settings, and it's also a um, uh, sort of an overview of their strengths and limitations. And it's free to download from the NADA website and I've put the hyperlink on this slide here. So assessment involves a detailed investigation of a person's mental health and it should be an ongoing process that takes into account changes in mental health symptoms throughout treatment. Assessment also involves case formulation and treatment planning. The components of assessment include presenting issues, AOD use history, medical history, risk assessment, psychiatric history, trauma history, mental state, readiness to change, family history, criminal history, current situation, strengths and weaknesses, personal history, and the source of referral. So for example, Leila identified that she was having problems at work with her family, her friends, her legal and financial issues. While we know that much, we do need to collect more information across these other dimensions. So during the assessment, it emerged that Leila had visited student psychological services several times when she was a uni student and described depressive episodes to them. Not long afterwards, she began to use a combination of methamphetamines and cannabis, found that methamphetamines lifted her mood and cannabis helped her calm down and sleep. Recently, she'd started taking methamphetamines and cannabis daily. 
The third element of identifying comorbidity is the process of case formulation. And this gathers and organizes all of the assessment information to address what problems exist, how they're developed and how they're maintained. It then generates a hypothesis as to how all of these factors fit together to form a current presentation of a client's or patient's symptoms and then informs treatment planning. So the process of case formulation should be person-centered, not service-centered. In addition to these dimensions that were included in the assessment, consideration should be given to Layla's age, her sex, sexual orientation, ethnicity, spirituality, socioeconomic status, and cognitive abilities. And with all of the information that Layla provided, she was diagnosed with bipolar one disorder. It can be really difficult to differentiate between substance induced and independent mental health disorders. Symptoms of mood, anxiety, and psychotic disorders might all be induced as a result of AOD use or withdrawal. So for example, alcohol use and withdrawal can induce symptoms of depression or anxiety. Manic symptoms can be induced by intoxication with stimulants, steroids, or hallucinogens. And psychotic symptoms can be induced by withdrawal from alcohol or intoxication with amphetamines, cocaine, cannabis, or LSD. So it can be useful to ask whether the client has any current mental health symptoms, such as depression, anxiety, or psychosis, whether they've experienced these in the past, and whether they've ever been diagnosed with a mental health disorder. If the client, so in this case, Layla, has experienced mental health symptoms or has been diagnosed with a mental health disorder, ask about the timing of these symptoms. So when did they first start? Did they start prior to the AOD use? Do they only occur when she's intoxicated or withdrawing? Have the symptoms continued even after a period of abstinence of approximately a month? Do the symptoms change when Layla stops using substances? Do they get better, do they get worse, or do they stay the same? Is there a family history of that particular mental health condition? If symptoms occur only in the context of intoxication or withdrawal, it's likely that they're substance induced and will, um, will resolve with a period of abstinence without the need for any direct intervention. But having said that, it's still really important to manage these symptoms to prevent her from relapsing. If um, mental health symptoms started before the onset of substance use, if they persist even during periods of abstinence, or if there's a family history of that particular mental health condition, they might have an independent mental health condition. So I'm gonna ask another poll here I'm going to try and launch another poll here. Here we go. Okay, and ask you um, from the information provided, do we think that Layla's mental health condition is substance induced, independent, or do we need more information to be able to tell? So I'll just wish I had some waiting music to play. I won't sing. <laughs> so I'll just wait. Um, yeah, another 10 or 15 seconds. Okay. Great. Looks like most people have um, sent something in. So um, there seems to be a bit of a split between whether it's independent or we need more information. That's actually, they're both, I would say both, right? So from the information we have so far, it's more likely that it's independent. You know, I know we have limited information. She began experiencing mental health symptoms before the onset of her AOD use. Um, but of course we do need more information. So either of those I would say would be right. Well done, everyone. <laughs> So in particular, it can be really difficult or it can be also really difficult to distinguish substance-induced psychosis from other psychotic disorders. So if a person is experiencing symptoms of psychosis, it might not be possible to elicit information that could help assess with the onset of symptoms like their family history, their AOD use and so on. But some substance-induced symptoms can help differentiate between substance-induced psychosis and independent psychotic disorders. So the key points to take from this part of um, the talk are 
uh, given the high rates of co-occurring mental health conditions among clients of AOD treatment services, it's essential that routine screening and assessment be undertaken for these conditions as part of case formulation. Consider a range of factors in the process of case formulation, so not only AOD and mental health conditions, but other socio-cultural factors, motivation, living situation, and medical and personal history. Full assessment should ideally take place after a period of abstinence, or at least when the client is not withdrawing or intoxicated. Conduct multiple assessments throughout treatment as symptoms may change over time. And provide assessment feedback to the client in a positive, easily understood way. Once comorbidity has been identified, we need to think about the next steps. Um, so this would be to formulate a plan in consultation with Layla and her family or carers or friends if appropriate. So the comorbidity guidelines, which I've mentioned at the beginning and throughout this talk, provide evidence-based management and treatment strategies, and I'll refer to them a little bit in this next section. So when developing a plan, the guidelines really emphasise taking a holistic healthcare approach, and this is focused on treating the person and not their illness. So given the complex problems that which, which are experienced by people with comorbidity, the goal of any service should be to improve quality of life across all domains, so including health, social welfare and housing, employment, criminal justice, and of course, AOD and mental health. This is particularly important as people with comorbidity are at particular risk of developing cardiovascular disease due to high rates of smoking, overweight and obesity, diabetes, poor diet, physical inactivity, high rates of alcohol consumption, um, and the use of some antipsychotic medications. So research has highlighted the need for interventions that focus on overall well-being, including reducing smoking, improving dietary habits, increasing physical activity, and improving sleep patterns. So from a health worker's perspective, remembering that physical and mental health are fundamentally entwined and focusing on overall well-being by providing a holistic response is likely to lead to improved outcomes. And just to point out as well, as Kath mentioned before, we'll be talking more about managing the physical health of people with comorbidity in a future webinar. Some service providers are reluctant to address multiple health provide, um, sorry, multiple health behaviours because of the belief that making too many lifestyle changes might undermine a person's recovery. Um, so although this is particularly evident in relation to smoking cessation, the view is not really supported by the evidence. So some strategies that can help healthcare workers overcome some of the barriers associated with these behavioural changes include helping clients minimise the physiological symptoms of nicotine withdrawal with nicotine replacement therapy or NRT, being mindful of different doses, the potential for NRT to interact with the metabolism of different medications and also contradictions for NRT, using the Australian Dietary Guidelines to help clients develop healthy eating patterns or the food spending structure, and this links household budgets to different food groups, the food and activity diary and other devices that track physical activity, such as pedometers, heart rate monitors and fitness trackers as motivational tools, as well as healthy sleep habits. So the broad focus of a holistic approach is really centered on delivering the right services to the right person at the right time. And this means that healthcare workers roles include involving multiple services in a coordinated client-centered approach. This also means that healthcare workers should be prepared to not only address mental and physical well-being of their clients, but also involve and partner with other services that can provide complete individualized care. So we're developing a plan. It's really um, essential to work with Layla and consider her as a whole person. So taking into account her, um, her psychological, her physical and socio-demographic perspectives. So before I go into detail about management and treatment approaches, I just wanted to touch on models of care. In terms of approaches to comorbidity, there are four main models in the treatment of comorbidity, which are sequential treatment, parallel treatment, integrated treatment and stepped care. I won't go into too much detail about these, but it's worth noting um, there's often a lot of discussion about models of care for people with comorbidity, but there's little research available to determine which models are better suited to which comorbidities. Um, and healthcare workers might need to make pragmatic decisions about which model is most appropriate for their individual clients or patients. Having said that, the idea of integrated treatments for two disorders has considerable intuitive appeal intuitive appeal and presents a number of advantages over other treatment approaches, including a single point of contact, so the client or the patient doesn't fall through the gaps, there are common objectives, the treatment is internally consistent, the relationship between AOD use and mental health conditions can be explored, and the communication problems between agencies doesn't interfere with treatment. 
So the research is quite limited in this space, there is some emerging evidence to suggest that integrated treatments might be superior to parallel or sequential treatments in terms of improving outcomes. So we will be talking more about management and treatment of comorbidity again at a future webinar um, and in more detail, but there is a distinction between management and treatment in that the goal of management is um, an interim approach and provides short term relief of symptoms until full treatment is possible. Management strategies described in the guidelines provide short term relief and, um, and control over symptoms. The guidelines provide do's and don'ts and practical strategies for managing commonly co occurring conditions. Managing symptoms um, can be quite tricky though, because once disorders are established, they both serve to maintain and exacerbate each other, whereby changes or improvements in one condition often leads to changes in the other. So there are a range of options for managing and treating comorbidity. And of course, not all treatments will suit everyone. Although many people are likely to be um, familiar with the more tr traditional psychological and pharmacological approaches, these have quite limited evidence for comorbidity. And in the absence of specific research, it's generally recommended to use the most effective treatments for each disorder. So both psychological and pharmacological interventions have been found to have some benefit. When pharmacotherapy is used, it should be accompanied by supportive psychological interventions with workers aware of the potential interactions between medications and other substances. In addition to these approaches, um, in the second edition of the guidelines, we have a discussion of e-health interventions, physical activity, and complementary and alternative therapies. For most disorders, exercise and physical health interventions have been shown to have some benefit. So for example, with uh, ADHD, schizophrenia, bipolar, depression, anxiety, OCD, PTSD, and eating disorders, but more research on comorbidity is really needed. So I won't um, go into too much detail here, but um, as I mentioned, the comorbidity guidelines um, discusses the evidence regarding the treatment of disorders for ADHD, psychosis, bipolar, depression, anxiety, uh, OCD, PTSD, eating disorders and personality disorders. And in addition, the management of symptoms that may cross various disorders like anger, grief and loss are provided. And as I said, we'll go into more detail about these if you're interested in, um, I think it's the, not the next webinar, but the one after. So Layla and her treatment team decided on a combination of psychotherapy and pharmacotherapy of antidepressants and mood stabilizers. At first, she had a lot of difficulty adjusting to her new medication regime and her compliance was really poor or quite poor. Over the first 12 months, she experienced three significant mood disturbances, two manic and one depressive. Her health worker organized a case review conference in which Layla was an active participant. And in addition to a full pharmacotherapy review, the team also identified the need to address her lifestyle and her physical health. So she started attending the local gym and reconnected with some of her friends. So the key points to take from the management and treatment for comorbidity are, although there are four models of care for the treatment of comorbidity, there's little definitive evidence to suggest which treatment or which model may be more suited to particular comorbidities. But integrated treatment approaches have a number of advantages over other treatment approaches, and there is some emerging evidence to support their use. There's a distinction between the management of mental health symptoms and treatment. Traditional psychological and pharmacological approaches have limited evidence for comorbidity, and in the absence of specific research, it's generally recommended to use the most effective treatments for each disorder. There's also emerging evidence um, that supports the use of e-health physical activity and complementary and alternative therapies for some disorders, but more research on comorbidity is needed. And finally for tonight, I really wanted to touch on coordinated care. So as many of you know, people with comorbidity often present to treatment with various issues that need to be addressed throughout the course of treatment. So for example, education and training, family situations, housing, legal issues, employment and physical health. So we really highlight the importance of health services and workers developing links with a range of local services and engaging them in clients or patients treatment where it's appropriate. So in practice, coordinated care should involve the coordinated, coordinated delivery of individual services across multiple sectors. And this is perceived as a seamless service system by clients, which results in overall improved client outcomes. So with Layla, as I mentioned before, we had identified mental health, legal issues, um, and physical health. So the types of services that would need to be brought in include criminal justice, psychologist, psychiatrist, and of course, her GP.
So I showed this image earlier in the webinar when I talked about some of the barriers clients and patients face when they're presenting to services. And this represents how clinical services have traditionally adopted a siloed approach in which mental and substance use disorders are treated separately, limiting treatment effectiveness. It is therefore really critical for care coordination and the referral process to focus on linking clients in with services as smoothly as possible. So the development of formal links between services regarding consultation, referral pathways and collaboration can help this process. And in fact, coordinated care increases the likelihood that clients will receive specialised assistance where it's needed, facilitates client engagement in treatment. Evidence has linked coordinated care um, with improved treatment outcomes and it's been found to prolong client retention, increase treatment satisfaction, improve quality of life, and increase the use of community-based services. In terms of a health worker role in coordinated care, this can involve the coordination, um, management, and delivery of appropriate services. And the challenge is in the active engagement of multiple services and service providers with a mixture of professional and non-professional support and also working out whose responsibility it is to coordinate care. So while primary, primary health care workers are in ideal positions to coordinate care and incorporate services that best reflect their client and patient's individual needs, um, they're often really time poor. So to give a summary of all of this information, AOD and other mental health disorders are common. Clients with comorbidity often have a variety of other medical, family and social problems such as housing, employment, welfare and legal problems. So it's really important to adopt a holistic approach to the management and treatment of comorbidity that's based on treating the person and not the illness. In addition to mental health services, health workers may need to engage with a range of other services to meet client and patient needs, including housing, employment, education, training, community, justice and other support services. And just to emphasize that despite comorbidity being common, the barriers to care and the difficulty accessing effective treatment that I've covered today, people can and do get better. So I just wanted to thank everybody for having joined us for this webinar. To complete the CPD assessment attached to the webinar, you can click on the link on this slide or um, I'm not sure if you can copy and paste it, but you can type it out or you can download these slides at the end and then click on it. Um, and remember to submit your responses. We'll be making the recording of this webinar and the slides that you've seen today available online at the CREMS website, which is comorbidity.edu.au uh, forward slash training forward slash webinars. And you can also join us at the next webinar, which is on the 7th of November. As Kath mentioned, we'll be having a more in-depth in discussion on identifying mental disorders and related conditions among people with substance use conditions. On the 21st of November, we'll, talk, we'll be talking about management and treatment of comorbidity. And on the 5th of December, in the final webinar of this series, we'll focus on management or managing physical health of people with comorbidity. And more webinar topics, um, I think as Kath talked about before, will be covered through the CREMS webinar series. If you're interested um, in any of these, you can subscribe to our mailing list. Thanks, Chris. That is a brilliant overview. <laughs> I don't know how you packed in so much in, in 40, oh, 50 minutes. That's a lot there, sorry. <laughs> oh, no, that's great. Um, I just want, we did have a, a, a question as well. And please, everyone, if you have any questions now that you want to post through, feel free um, to chat about. But one question um, that came sort of early on in the presentation, uh, when you were talking about the order of onset of conditions, and you talked about the um, management um, not being affected by the order of onset. Um, we had a question about, isn't management different depending on what drugs and mental health symptoms are there? Um, sorry, can you say that again? Yeah, sure. Sorry, I've probably confused you actually by my <laughs> question. Um, isn't management different depending on what drugs and mental health symptoms are present. So different drugs used. So I think it's probably, I guess what I was thinking um, was that that's absolutely right. And, and a really good point that, that you are managing different symptoms depending on what drugs are being used uh, and what mental health symptoms are present, but it does depend on, um, but sorry, the order in which they present 
doesn't change. So whether or not the substance use came before the depression or the anxiety came after substance use, that doesn't change. Is that, is that right? Yes. Um, yes, I think we were talking about, you know, the strategies used to manage the conditions are the same. Um, but yeah, you're right. It doesn't matter. Um, it doesn't matter which came first. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Yeah. 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 Sorry, I'm getting confused. Yeah, yeah no, no. Because I think it is a very important sort of, um, in terms of knowing how a person came to be where they are mm. when they present to you, it's an important piece of information. But in terms of the strategies you might use to treat, it's not as important, I guess. Um, just having a look here as well. I was wondering, or one of the questions, if you might want to talk a bit about the e-health interventions that um, you mentioned. Are they interventions that are sort of standalone or are they ones that um, clinicians can use with their clients? Uh, I think there's a, a bit of a range. And I think actually, Kathy, you can talk about some of the ones that you've been involved with um, one of the local health districts. Um, but... I think there's a range and the evidence is quite varied. Some of them are, you know, self-complete that people can go through on their own. Um, and the place that you can look for that kind of information is CRUFAD um, for their anxiety. Uh, actually, their mood clinic, Mood Online, I think it's called now. Used to be Anxiety Online, now I think it's called Mood Online. And they've got a range of different um, e-health um, programs that you can go through. And I'm not sure whether they're... Um, I'm not sure whether you need a clinician to go through as well. Putting me on the spot. Um, I know, that's right. <laughs> uh, other ones that um, maybe you could talk about, Katha, Deal and Shade? Um, yeah, so um, I, I totally agree with what you're saying, that there are a combination, that there are some that people mm -hmm. can do on their own and some people prefer to do on their own because um, but especially those people where they don't actually want to seek clinician assistance but do want some sort of intervention where they don't have to interact um, so there are some e-health interventions like that but then there are other ones that the clinician can facilitate access to as well and it can become um, like a, a accompaniment or a part of their care package if you like um, that they can use 24 7 really and um, yeah, and I think in the guidelines you, you specify as well for each of the disorders what different health interventions there are and the evidence behind those. So I do, yes, but I can't remember them off the top of my head. I know, that's right. <laughs> but there is that information if you're yeah. looking for more, um, more disorder-specific interventions, what's available, there is that overview there. Okay. And you mentioned quite a few different treatment options there, like sort of the pharmacological treatment options, psychological options, uh, e-health, and a few others. I'm wondering, do you think that consumers and carers and sort of the general public are really aware of how many different options there are? In general, um, for comorbidity, you mean, or just for cross disorders? You're probably both, actually, yeah. Uh, I don't know. I think it depends... I, I think it would really be quite variable, probably not on the whole. Um, I guess like with any health condition, you would find people who, you know, really know where to do their research and can do their research and look into things online. Mm. Um, and there are people who just don't know and don't know where to find out. And I guess with the internet, I think it's both a blessing and a curse. There is so much information available, but a lot of it is not great um, not great information, mm -hmm. you know, like, yeah. So uh, I think it's, it's, it, it's, it depends. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. they okay, kind of highlighting that need for, not just clinicians being aware of what resources mm. are available or what different options are, but people knowing what treatments to ask for as well. Yeah, exactly. Knowing, you know, going to your, your healthcare provider with, yeah, with something to ask for, I think is really important, but knowing where to get that information to start with, I think that can be a real challenge. Yeah. And when people um, do first think, you know, I, I'm, I need some help and I want to go and see someone about this, where is it that they typically go? Like you, What's that first point of contact? I think it depends on severity. I guess for a lot of people, it would be their GP um, asking for help, in which case they can ask for a mental health plan. Um, for some people, if they're on the more severe end of the spectrum, they might end up in emergency, which, um, you know, they might follow a different path 
um, through care. And then for other people, if they're really not doing very well, it might be that they, um, their first contact is with police, which, you know, as first responders um, is again, a different pathway. So mm. I guess it really depends on their severity and what they're doing at the time. And yeah. Yeah. And I guess, and uh, also equally important, I guess, not, not just the health field, mm. uh, in terms of people that are involved in care, it's, it's not just the traditional people, it's not just the social services, it's also the justice services that perhaps need to be a bit more comorbidity or informed. Yeah, what to look for and what to do if you find somebody who, mm. you know, who comes up, who you come across with comorbidity. Yeah. So they don't end up, you know, in a cell. <laughs> yeah. And is the they were all the questions that we had from the audience so far. Any others that anyone wants to ask before we wrap up? If you do think of anything and you, you know, don't want to ask now or want to ask later, feel free to email me. My email address is up there c.morel.unsw oh sorry at unsw.edu.au and um just as well again if you want to complete those cpd assessments there's the link on the screen um and you can also get that afterwards but um thank you everyone for joining us it's been really great and we hope to see you again at our next webinar on the 7th of november which uh, as chris said is on identification going into more detail on, on formal and informal assessment methods there so thank you all for joining us and thank you very much chris thank you